Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 900,000 high quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 30% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE5. Here's the tunnel leading to his stronghold. <laughs> it's like walking into the dragon's mouth. Oh! Who can that intruder be? Nothing can approach my castle without being detected. By activating the power within my miraculous rings, I can easily block his entrance. All right, go, go, go! Now. It's Frame Rate! Episode 123, I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood, and that was a completely non-racially charged representation of the Mandarin in the 1960s version of the cartoon. According, at least according to the 1960s. Yes, that's, that's... Uh, well, yes, and, and it was common, it was fashionable in those days to Wait, was say that, that you would... Was that from the movie? Because the Mandarin's use... in the movie. You would use your miraculous rings to brock Tony Stark. That's what they... <laughs> it's freaking embarrassing. I know. Uh, and, and with that, we bring in our guest for this episode <laughs> of Frame Rate. Uh, joining us, we've been trying to get him on the show for a long time. We're very happy to have Andy Wallenstein, editor-in-chief of Digital at Variety and author of most of the articles we rip off when we talk about these subjects. <laughs> on Frame Rate. How's it going, Andy? Uh, it is a pleasure to be ripped off and it is a pleasure to be with you gentlemen. Hey, it's great to have you uh, along with us. We got a lot of stuff uh, to talk about this week. Let's get right into it with the big story. This just in, the big story. We, I kind of collected a bunch of stories together. They're all big into one because it was New Fronts last week. Uh, if you don't know what upfronts are in TV land, then new fronts doesn't make any darn sense. It barely makes sense as it is. But it's basically trying to sell advertisers on the shows that are coming for the following year. And what a bunch of web companies have taken to do is the same thing, saying, hey, we're going to sell you on our shows that are coming up. So YouTube, Yahoo, AOL, Hulu all out there pitching to advertisers. Uh, we, could, we could start with YouTube because they took the pitch a little differently. Last year when they did it, they said, hey, we're high quality. We're funding all these you know, top quality channels from big names. This year they said, we're not TV. We're the future of TV. Uh, and does that seem a little bit, oh, I mean, does that seem a little disingenuous to, to where it's just like, yeah, no, we always thought we were cooler than television, which is, uh, wait, were we, were we trying to look like TV last year? I don't, I don't remember that. I don't remember wearing that dress. No, we're, we're web, man. Totally different. And they trotted out Macklemore and, and, uh, Felicia Day. I mean, th these are not unknowns, uh, in, in the world of entertainment. A Andy, what do you think of YouTube's shift of strategy? Well, I'm going to borrow a bit from Macklemore and compare what YouTube and a lot of these other companies are doing to a thrift shop in the sense that this is kind of discounted video content compared to the much more expensive stuff that's going to come on the TV side uh, a few weeks from now. And so what these companies are doing is they're hoping by doing these events in the exact same style as the TV networks, they will bring a comfort level to Madison Avenue who they're, they're the skittish types. They're scared very easily. They're confused very easily. Uh, so that by sort of imitating TV style, but at lower prices, uh, they're going to get a lot more uptake uh, from these advertisers. Well, so here's the part that's confusing so to me. To pop some tags is what you're yeah, saying. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they'll need a uh, lot the, more than $20 in their pocket. <laughs> the, the thing that's confusing to me is that part of the reason you have upfronts is because you want people to buy advertisement on these particular shows, but that's not what YouTube does. They insist that you, you buy demographics, you don't buy particular programs, and that's been a point of contention with a lot of content providers. Is that, is, is that 
any kind of conflict there? Or do you just think it's a case where it's like they need to build the brand so they might as well ape the structure of traditional television? Well, they, they're aping it right down to the fact that they're taking a select group of content, as you saw, uh, particularly with what AOL and Yahoo does, where they get sort of their very best stuff. They pack some stars into it. They're going to put some promotion behind it. And they're saying just like the TV networks are going to put their fall lineup in and you are able to buy money – sorry, buy advertising up front – they want you to do the same thing in online, even though online is fundamentally totally different in the sense that there is no scarcity. There is so much inventory that the whole notion of an upfront, it's, it's kind of what they're doing is artificial. And whether it will actually work, well, time will tell. Yeah, Hulu's pitch uh, was almost the opposite of YouTube's. Uh, they said, hey, we got four million people here and we're going to sell the ads to you exactly the way you're used to from television. You can buy shows. You can target demographics. Uh, we'll do exactly what whatever it is you want. So whereas YouTube, like Brian was saying, sort of says, hey, you know what? You just buy an ad and we run it all across YouTube.com. Hulu is allowing the more traditional approach. Four million people – is a lot for Hulu. It's it's a good number for them to tout. It also pales when you compare it to 30 million from Netflix. But of course, Hulu has ads. Netflix does it. How how how, how much should we make of that difference? Do you think? Uh, I think there's a lot to be made of that difference, especially in light of the total uncertainty as what on earth Hulu's future is. Uh, if you've been following lately, just just for those who don't know. Hulu is jointly owned by Disney, News Corp, and there's also a silent interest on the part of NBC Universal. But all parties involved have signaled that they are either going to sell this to a fourth party or one of the existing uh, News Corp or Disney is going to pick it up for themselves. Now, the thing is, is this is not just a matter of who's controlling the purse strings. It's about the very structure of this business. So you could see, for instance, News Corp buying Hulu and going right after Netflix, going only on a subscription basis, whereas the word is, is that if, diff if Disney buys Hulu, they actually may de-emphasize the subscription side of the business and go completely ad-supported, which makes this 4 million figure potentially worthless in the long run. So – humongous question mark hanging over Hulu right now. Well, and, and keep in mind also that the the comparison of this 4 million uh, unit number to the 30 million isn't really fair because we're not talking about a total user base. In Netflix, 30 million is the complete user base. Uh, Hulu, of course, has, I guess, an unknowable user base because not everyone is necessarily registered. Uh, but out of however big that user base is, 4 million of them are essentially double paying. They're paying they're paying the premium and paying to, with their time to watch all of the ads. So I think that's it, comparable, though, because Netflix's user base is paying. Yes. Well, well, I mean, they're only paying once, though. They're not paying and then also paying yeah. for ads. I, th I think it is. I think if if uh, Netflix offered, I, I, if Netflix also randomly said, "Hey, sign up and you can continue to pay us," but now we'll also throw ads at you, uh, I would I would be surprised if they hit. 4 million subscribers. So if you think about it that way of essentially, I, I don't know, taking it up to the next level uh, and, and having these super fans, I guess, for lack of a better word, who are double paying for all their content, I think it is remarkable. Brian, uh, Hulu uh, Plus is, sorry, Brian, Hulu Plus is a double pay in the sense that those subscribers are also being served ads. It's not like yes. Netflix. Right, correct. No, that's that's exactly my point. Is that is that you shouldn't compare the four million to the thirty million because it's amazing that you could get four million people full stop to double pay for a service to pay money or, monthly. Or you should compare the four million to the thirty million to say like just think how many more they'd have if they didn't force ads down people's throats and maybe Absolutely. they'd be making True. money like Netflix. The one thread that does go through all of these presentations, we haven't talked much about Yahoo and AOL yet, are the original shows. So Hulu was uh, touting The Awesomes, a uh, co-creation of Seth Meyers uh, from Saturday Night Live. And I'm, I'm blanking on the other guy's name. He's one of the writers at Saturday Night Live. Yahoo has a whole slate up there, uh, including uh, shows from uh, Juliana Strickland and Natasha Feldman, uh, celebrity chef Megan Mitchell. There's uh, John Stamos interviewing other celebrities about their first sexual experience. Uh, that's, that's Yahoo. 
AOL is going a little lifetime where they have uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, executive producing City Ballet, a look into the competitive world of ballet. You've also got uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Tracy Anderson talking with women who've overcome hardship and injury. And there, there's some other stuff like uh, a, a potter named Jonathan Adler with Inspiration Point, Anthony Eats America with actor Anthony Anderson. L looking through all these shows, uh, I'd like to get both your guys' uh, take. If any caught your eye, or particularly horrified you, or, or you thought maybe this this would be the thing that would finally get viewers to go to one of these services. Well, right before we went live, I called Justin to see if he was going to join us, Justin Robert Young, and uh, he had a conflict and wasn't able to make it. But he said, uh, he said, here, I'm going to give you some advice for free right before you go. He said, pay attention to how thematically people are choosing, each of these institutions are choosing what kind of content they want to have. If Netflix has paved the way by trying to be HBO, like everything they're doing is lockstep in the quality presentation and the type of programming that they're doing with their original content, they're exactly HBO. So that niche is filled. Remember, we've talked before about this idea of people are going around the board trying to play the game of Monopoly and they need to fill up all the squares. So now we're seeing, uh, for example, uh, Amazon, if you looked at their pilots, a bunch of the pilots were all comedy. So maybe in this case, they're trying to be the TBS of uh, new media. And in this case, you've got, um, uh, I think it was, uh, I might mix these up, but AOL's programming looks like they're heavily focused on, uh, uh, oh, no, 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 I guess, you no, know, Yahoo's had, almost all the shows you mentioned were reality television, which of mm -hmm. course is a smart thing to do because that's very cheap and you can very take bravo. a lot of gambles. And wait, yes, exactly. And waiting for one of them to take off. And then AOL is is trying to be maybe a maybe like an E type network. Um, but Brian, we have to draw a distinction here between what Netflix and Amazon are doing and the companies at the new fronts. What Netflix in particular is doing, I mean, we're talking about per episode costs that are probably anywhere from five to ten times what the cost of what you're going to see on Yahoo or AOL, where, yeah, they've got some celebrities here and there, but this is going to be bargain basement programming in terms of the cost, which Absolutely. isn't to say that it can't be good. And that's really a fundamental question here. Expensive doesn't necessarily mean good. I mean, Netflix well, it, has proven they can do both, but it's, you know, this is not a new phenomenon, what we're seeing at the new fronts in terms of this kind of programming. They've been doing this for four, five, six years. None of it gets any real traction, though. I don't know if you guys have seen Burning Love on Yahoo from last season. That, I think, stands head to shoulders with anything I've seen on basic cable in terms of comedy. So some potential, but let's not pretend this is in the same league as House of Cards. Well, and, th and this is also, I think they're playing the right game because if what you don't have is the budget to go for extreme quality, then you go for extreme quantity and you look for increasingly niche programming, which, you know, and, and this very much feels like just uh, if they're playing roulette, they're playing the, the, as big a spread as they can to see which one of these connect with a decent sized audience. Sure. And, and, and I'd also note that Yahoo made a deal to pick up clips from the 38-year library of Saturday Night Live, which, okay, you say clips, what's the big deal? But I think something like that may actually have more value in terms of just getting a steady wheel of traffic going on Yahoo than any of the stuff on the original side because while the originals may be sort of a sexier business, when you've got stuff that, you know, has a pre-sold identity to the audience. Everyone knows what Saturday Night Live is. Everyone wants to see these clips going back to, you know, 30 years, even though when you see stuff like Eddie Murphy, Chevy Chase, that stuff really may have more value than anything that they're doing on the originals front. So don't discount that. Well, and when we talked about that last week, we were pointing out that this also creates a relationship with a top content creator. So you may start by licensing the old stuff, but possibly down the road, you, you start getting some high quality content from them. At least you have the, the possibility of that because you've got conversations and you've got a relationship to build on. True. Well, I think that uh, that's it for new fronts. Unless you guys got anything else to add, uh, we should move along to another. Yes. Yes. Stop everything. It's another big story. Two Nielsen stories here. Uh, this is actually, sorry, we're still talking about new fronts uh, because, because uh, some of this relates to Hulu and its 4 million number. A uh, new report from Nielsen detailing who's paying what, 
for entertainment content and how much they're shelling out for it online. Uh, it looks like generally online premium video consumers skew mail. They're likely to be 25 to 44, and they're more likely than the average Internet user to be Asian or Hispanic. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that there's a lot you could read into that. Uh, to me, the biggest uh, the the biggest thing to latch onto the story was the subhead, which is you know meet the typical online video consumer. He pays for what he watches, and he's aged twenty five to forty four. And so the fact that you have, uh, you know, I love the fact that the more of this research that we see how people consume their media, the less we have the stink of piracy on on high quality content that's viewed online. Uh, and so I mean. Were you surprised by any of this? Um, I do. I, I wasn't necessarily surprised. Certainly not with the you know the numbers of, of everything going up. Amount of movies streamed through Netflix and Amazon up twelve percent. TV shows up twenty four percent. This is all typical. This is all in line with all the other studies we've seen. But the idea of it being twenty five to forty four may be a bad piece of news for YouTube when they're trying to sell ads for that younger eighteen to thirty four market. I don't know. Now, that's definitely true. YouTube's out there trying to hit a, a much younger marketplace, uh, certainly as low as, you know, 12, 13 years old. I think the stats that you're referencing are speaking much broader than just the YouTube world. And sure. that's probably why you're seeing an older skew. But, you know, this isn't the sexiest subject in the world when we're talking about Nielsen measurement. But I got to tell you, when you talk to people in the media business, this is the issue. I mean, people getting paid for the eyeballs watching their programming. I mean, it sounds almost obvious, but the fact is, is that Nielsen has been glacially slow in terms of helping media companies track what viewers are watching, whether it's on your computer, tablet, smartphone. And that's why this is such an important issue. And we've talked before about the digital online campaign ratings and how ABC was doing a unified sell and all of that. Talk, talk about exciting news. Uh, <laughs> but we talked about how important that is for that to happen if we want more quality programs available over the Internet. Uh, starting this month, a and &E, ABC, AOL, CBS, Fox, and NBC taking part in Nielsen digital program ratings. Now, I don't fully understand the difference between the campaign and the program, but I know just enough to be dangerous. And I, I think what it means is the campaign rates particularly the ads, and that's what you sell on, whereas the digital program ratings are what we're used to hearing about overall ratings for an entire show. Uh, and it's a way to show the level of interest in a show when you're making a pitch. Does that sound right, Andy? More or less, the truth is we don't know much about the details here. It, it does seem an extension of what Nielsen uh, is already doing. I mean, the truth is, though, what I, what I don't have clarity on that I would love to understand is how quickly the gap is closing between the kinds of content that is being watched on television sets versus the same content, whether it's on ABC.com, Hulu, an app. My guess is, is that gap is not closing quite as quickly as us, you know, savvy new media types think it is. But it's become it's going to become very important for media companies to understand that, because to my earlier point, if you don't have me measurement done properly, the entire business, it just doesn't work. Well, and that's the counterintuitive thing. If what you want is high quality programming available on the web, then weirdly you need to hope for lots of good ads. And what I mean by that is well-targeted ads that, that show results for the investors who do that. And you can't do that, as you mentioned, unless you have the built-in structure of a reliable provider for that information. And, and nobody beats Nielsen when it comes to that reputation. And that's from true. now on, frame rate will be in Spanish and Mandarin, just <laughs> as a strategic move. Let's move on to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Ah, it's time for the Aereo Circus update. Uh, the, the latest news. Aereo has filed a suit in advance of CBS, who's been threatening to file a suit in every market Aereo moves into, asking the U.S. District Court in Manhattan for a declaratory judgment saying that they have no right 
to file these suits. It seems to be based on some things CBS has posted on Twitter, some things in, a, in an earnings call. Uh, it's, it's unclear what effect this would have even if they want it. It's a little bit of an unusual move, but it also shows how confident Aereo is being. Before we get comments on this, we should also point out that Time Warner's uh, CEO, speaking to the Washington Post, Glenn Britt, said Time Warner what Aereo is doing to bring broadcast signals to its customers is interesting. If it's found legal, we can conceivably use similar technology, which sent the entire National Association of Broadcasters into a tizzy. And then uh, CBS CEO Les Moonves uh, has said it before, and he said it again, that by taking they, by by allowing Aereo to be legal, CBS would be one of the networks that would pull their free over-the-air broadcasts off. And he says we could do it in a, we could do it in a day, a couple of days, I think is, is what All he right, said. Let's, well, let's go in reverse order because we've been saying from the beginning that these are empty threats. But as they sort of firm up their position, we've seen showdowns when, you know, like Dish and AMC get into it. And then they do yank services for a while. But if they do kind of have their bluff called and then they do stop broadcast. I got to imagine the only story will be, here's so-and-so. He's poor and watches television the old-fashioned way. Thanks for yanking out, C CBS. You're a big jerk. I just don't see any way that they come out uh, in a better position. I mean, on paper, you could say, okay, and then all of a sudden now we're doing, we're getting more rebroadcast license fees because more people watch on cable or whatever. But this just seems like it would be a public relations disaster for CBS or any of these guys if they were to do this. Yes, it would be. Uh, you're, you're totally right. You're reading this correctly in the sense that, A, public relations disaster. B, they actually would probably, and this is just a school of thought. There's no way to conclusively determine that they would actually make more money if they were on cable instead of broadcast. And let, well, that, That's a rabbit hole we don't want to fall down in terms of details. But here's the thing. This is why I think you're even seeing the threats of, hey, we're going to switch to cable if you keep talking like this, Ariel, is that in a sense – Aereo provides cover for the broadcast networks to convert to cable. They have someone to blame. They could say, hey, don't blame us. It's these Aereo terrorists that are making us run for cable. I think on some level, though I don't think it's likely, broadcast is looking for an excuse to switch to cable because that is a more lucrative business model. And don't Absolutely. forget, we mentioned before, CBS bought a company – that specializes in enabling local broadcasters to stream online. So that could be another way they spin this story is like, well, we've been forced to change our over-the-air broadcast signal by by Aereo and, and the activist judges. Uh, and But we are making our stream available for free online as, as in recompense. I, I, that could be a strategy there as Actually, well. Actually, yeah, and it did work for uh, for AMC. They they were able to navigate that that whole thing by making Breaking Bad available for people to instantly stream. If they frame it like they're being held hostage by the tyranny of Aereo, I don't know. Actually, you might have you might have swayed me back. There may be a, a way for them to kind of navigate this, but but in general, I mean, it, it uh, nobody nobody is going to take the broadcaster's side on this. You know, it's just so pitiful that it's even come to this. The fact that Aereo has gotten whatever traction it's gotten in the marketplace, which by the way, I don't think is that much, is is a testament to the fact that the very thing that they're doing, which for those who don't remember, it's just putting broadcast signals available to watch across platforms with a cloud-based DVR. Area would never be able to do this if the companies that had these broadcast signals, the distributors, weren't already doing this product. So when Glenn Britt from Time Warner Cable says, well, hey, we could do it too, you know. Well, why didn't they think of that a year ago? Then maybe we wouldn't even be in this mess with Aereo. Well, and th this is the real nightmare, right? The reason Time Warner and Comcast and all of these others didn't think about it years ago is because they already have enough fights with the broadcasters over carriage fees. Uh, to, the idea of doing Aereo was just picking a fight. I don't think that any, any of them wanted. I'm giving them a lot of credit to say they could have thought of it. But even if they had thought of it, uh, it pro they probably would have been scared away. So Aereo's providing them some cover too, saying, oh, well, maybe we could get away from carriage fees uh, by using this. So it's it's going to end up in Congress. That, that's been my position the whole way along. I, I think they're just going to force this it, it to being a legislative issue. As soon as Aereo wins in the courts, and I think they probably will, uh, the, the broadcasters will all go to Congress and say, hey, you know, you gave us all of this free uh, use of the airwaves. If, if you want us to continue to do it for free for you, you need to give us more laws because that makes so, sense. Okay, so when Time Warner Cable 
says that they could see emulating Aereo's business model. Are they essentially saying, hey, rebroadcasting content without having to pay a rebroadcast fee sounds pretty rad to us. Maybe we just create our own Time Warner Cable free over-the-air antenna service, and now those are a bunch of channels that we don't have to pay rebroadcast fees on. Is that is this maybe what they're really crapping bricks about over at CBS and Fox? Well, that I, I think so, they because then CBS hearing. and Fox would not be getting hundreds of millions of dollars in retransmission consent exactly. fees, which Time Warner Cable would be only too willing to not pay. Uh, that said, you know, Tom, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think Aereo is going to score any significant legal victory here. I think the ground that they are on is shaky. Nevertheless, even in a loss, uh, they could win a larger moral victory in the sense that I think they're going to push uh, the marketplace to have distributors offer these kind of products. And I think what may be the ultimate win for the distributors is if they can make their existing customer base pay extra for the very kinds of features that Aereo is going to the marketplace with for just, you know, $8. All right, so I got, I got a question for you, Andy. If you're going to lay yeah. odds, what are the chances that already there's some quiet negotiations between Aereo and these uh, broadcasters? Because it seems like there has to be some, some broadcast fee that would be okay for Aereo to throw some cash at. Like if they can negotiate something to make this work, clearly – However few people are using Aereo right now, there's a demand for these people who want to be able to watch television in their local area, real time, et cetera, and they're paying some amount. There's a pie there to be divided, and I would imagine that if they paid yeah, maybe not the full rebroadcast fee that you're seeing in cable, uh, but, but something I would imagine they would be, be able to come to terms with. Here, here's why I'm going to disagree with you, because I'm going to go back to the point of I don't think Aereo has anywhere close to significant marketplace traction that would – Put them in a position where they can go to the broadcasters and say, hey, let us be your cross-platform broadcast provider. In a way, it's kind of a comparison to TiVo. And TiVo actually did get some marketplace traction early on, but it didn't stop the distributors from just offering their own generic DVR solutions that essentially put TiVo back in its place. So if TiVo wasn't able to sort of uh, be the big disruptor, I don't think the Aereo brand will be either. You got to understand this media coverage out there right now is magnifying Aereo so much bigger than it actually is. I'd Absolutely. be stunned if they had more than like 100,000 subscribers. That is my complete off the cuff estimate. Uh, they're getting tons of free marketing from all this press. But I mean, remember, they just have broadcast networks and maybe like one cable network. Who wants that? And if you do want that, then you've got a digital antenna. So I, I, uh, I just don't – I think we're giving Aereo more credit than it deserves. Well, well they're, sell, you, they're selling it to people who can't get over the air broadcasting because of the position their they're dwelling is in and people who just want that convenience of being able to get that, that kind of uh, television over – mobile devices but you're right that's not that many people the fact that the broadcast networks are making such a big deal of, out of this and fanning the flames of what the media was already making a big deal out of it because it was new and weird uh is, is is great for area they they love this yeah. and as far as the courts go we may both end up be being right because this may end up going to the supreme court with half the country's districts uh going with that alki david precedent that we talked about earlier from la where they said yeah. basically an area like service although it didn't have region restrictions was against the law and we could have the district courts in the east coast saying it is you know it is legal and then then it gets en ended up being settled by the supreme court I'll see you at the Supreme Court. We'll watch You'll it again. See at the Supreme Court. Let's you guys bring your popcorn. popcorn. Uh, this episode of Frame Rate brought to you by Shutterstock.com. If you're a creator out there who's like, you know, I just want someone to take my show and put it somewhere, uh, you'll find that stock imagery can be difficult to find and maybe sometimes expensive. But that's because you haven't discovered Shutterstock.com. Whether it's for your website or it's a publication, an advertisement, uh, any other type of project, you can choose from over 900,000 high-quality stock video clips, 2D or 3D animation, even motion graphics. Uh, they have clips in a variety of digital formats. Most come in high def. 
Shutterstock, Shutterstock sources their video clips from around the world, so you get the entire globe at your fingertips. And a lot of the things that are contributed are from professional filmmakers and animators, so you get a high quality. Shutterstock reviews each video individually for content and quality before adding it to its library, but that doesn't mean they're not adding lots of stuff. They add over 10,000 video clips each week, so every time you visit, you're going to find something new. And what I like about Shutterstock myself is the search tool. I mean, for It's a Thing, I use their, their stock images uh, for our blog posts, and I can put in crazy stuff like feminism and whiskey, and they'll come up with an image that's appropriate to that. Uh, there's also shareable clip boxes. You can save your video assets to a clip box and share them with collaborators. Huge image library, as I mentioned, of photos, vectors, and icons. Flexible pricing. You got to go try it. And you don't even need a credit card. Just start an account. Begin using Shutterstock. Help imagine what your next project could be like. Do some video selections. Do some searches. Save some stuff to a clip box. Then if you say, you know what, I really do want to use this. I want to get the, that, that easy royalty. Makes it legal for me to use this. Use the offer code FRAMERATE5 and new accounts will receive 30% off any package. And they have multiple packages there. That's Shutterstock.com. 30% off new accounts. Use that offer code FRAMERATE5. And we thank Shutterstock for their support of FRAMERATE. Let's see what's in the slipstream. Uh, as Brian alluded to uh, last week, 1,800 titles. Well, it was like 1,794 titles. Almost 1,800 titles left the Netflix service. Uh, but do we care? I do. I mean, first of all, that's the whole reason I brought it up. There's some good stuff in there. Now, we've talked about this before. Netflix is right to find a specific voice for the type of content that they should do. They're right to let go of daily show episodes and ephemera and, and stuff that's going to be topical and instead pursue that uh, narrative long form television and movie experience that with that they do very well with. But along the way, you get some nasty collateral damage. Avatar The Last Airbender, those three seasons, I uh, watched over and over and over again, watched it with each of my kids as they got old enough to experience it, and I'm bummed that that's gone. Well, what you're seeing is the fact, well, a number of things. Number one, Netflix has very clearly communicated to investors that it is no longer going to be positioning itself as the place where is the most comprehensive source of video. And my guess is you'll see Amazon try to take that mantle from them. Uh, the reason is, is that as the original programming comes on like House of Cards, they're not going to be able to afford to spend, you know, billions on original content and go just as deep and long on the library side. So they're getting a little picky and choosy here. That also coincides with the fact that some of their first or second rounds of deals with content companies come up. And these content companies, regardless of how this content is actually doing on Netflix, want to get more money for that content. And Netflix, I think, wisely is saying, well, not in every case. So you're going to see a more curated list. Um, I don't quite get the sense at this point that there's a particular rhyme or reason in terms of a, a market positioning of, you know, this is content that's good for men or it's action adventure or whatnot. I think you're just seeing more of a, a picking and choosing based on the best library deals that they can make while still leaving enough cash over to do the kinds of uh, arrested development originals that you'll yeah, see. Yeah, I think that's the disappointing part to me is that there isn't a particular voice. There's not a when, – when somebody firmly establishes their brand, it's the kind of thing where you could name a show and you would just know in your gut like, oh, that's a Netflix kind of show or that's, a, that's an Amazon show. Now, we're early in the game and stuff's being renegotiated, but uh, it, it kills me that, that now it feels more hodgepodgey as a result, even though that's not the intended – uh, effect. But Brian, I think you're, you're holding Netflix to almost too high a standard. I mean, think of networks like HBO, which, yes, they develop a very distinct personality based on their mix of original programming. But once you go beyond original programming to, say, their, their library of theatricals, there's no rhyme or reason there beyond just what output deals that they have with various studios. There's no thematic thread there. And that's all I think Netflix is doing. They're going to build a personality based on an original programming mix. And I don't think that personality is going to emerge for another year or two, depending mm -hmm. on how various kinds of programming does. But I think you got to give them a pass once you get to the library side because they just don't – while that's sort of the, the date they brought to the dance, they're, they're ditching that date now. They found a hotter girl. It's called original programming, and that's how they want to be known. That's a good point.
Lots of uh, uh, partnerships out there between big media companies and YouTube channels. Here's another one. DreamWorks Animation uh, Acquiring Awesomeness TV, a YouTube network aimed at teens that was created by Brian Robbins, a uh, child star. Uh, they, do, they do a lot of kids programming. They were in talks to maybe doing a show on Nickelodeon itself. And uh, now they're going to have a nice, big, rich partner. Yeah, this is this is a bigger deal than you might think in the sense that I think it speaks to the maturation beginning on these new YouTube brands like Awesomeness or Machinima or any number that I could point to. I, I mean, Awesomeness is really almost like a – it's like a Nickelodeon or an MTV for the future. And I think DreamWorks was really smart to buy in – sorry, DreamWorks Animation. That's a, separate than DreamWorks. Uh, they're smart to sort of buy in on the ground floor of the future because at the end of the day, what doesn't change between the old and now is the power of brands. Better buy Awesomeness TV while it costs $33 million as opposed to a year or two from now when they've done even better and they cost $300 million. You know, I got to tell you, I'm just – I'm so bullish on the creativity you're seeing on, on the YouTube platform with – the creme de la creme of content creators like Awesomeness TV, you know, kind of pursuant to what we were talking about earlier with what they're doing at the new fronts. What YouTube is breeding right now really is a separate beast than conventional television. And it's, it's very much its own creature that's very much tailored to the YouTube platform, to the fact that it can interact with users. You're going to need companies like Awesomeness TV that could specialize that and really nail that down. I think you're going to see a lot more of these – not a lot more. You're going to see more of these kinds of deals as existing content companies realize that if they want to participate in the brands of the future, they better buy in now. And Google's still trying to figure out the best way to make money off this. They're obviously selling ads, as we heard in the new front, but also uh, Financial Times reporting that the paid channel subscriptions may launch this week. YouTube has confirmed they're going to do paid channel subscriptions, but they weren't giving any timelines or any details. According to Financial Times, later this week, they'll launch and channel subscriptions will start at $1.99 a month. Now, I'm glad you brought what you just brought up, Andy, about this kind of hotbed of creativity at YouTube because I think if you're not into one of the channels or one of the shows, you don't understand the rabid following that some of these have and you might wonder, well, why would I Why would I pay $2 a month for anything on YouTube? Yeah, but let me talk out of both sides of my mouth for a second All and right. say on the one hand that I am appreciative of the hotbed of creativity, I'm also a little skeptical about consumers paying for that creativity as opposed to YouTube monetizing through ads. Look, it, it, it's, we don't know enough about what exactly they're going to be charging for to really pass judgment here. But when I think about what is on YouTube, uh, is it going to be, for instance, in the case of Awesomeness TV, am I going to pay $2 a month for some kind of content from there if I'm a 15-year-old in their target demographic? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think part of the appeal of YouTube is you don't pay. So I'm going to... And withhold, you know, total judgment now until we see what the details are of what exact content is coming down the pike here. But I'm a little skeptical off the top of my head because it's not as if I could think of existing YouTube content and say, oh, my God, I could so see spending two dollars for that content. So well, let me, let me throw me this at you, because this is a. a in addition to frame rate, I host a show called Scam School, which is all about how to score free drinks at the bar using magic tricks and, and you know, and puzzles. Uh, it is based, it has a hard limit to the type of content we could teach you on there. It has to be dead simple, that stuff that people can do tonight when they go out with their friends. And there's been an increasing demand for uh, more complicated magic tutorials that, that quite simply wouldn't be profitable for my time or effort that it would take to, uh, to teach this more advanced, specific technical content. But if I could get enough subscriptions and create a paywall behind which there's this walled garden, uh, right now the way I'm having to solve it is by releasing individual downloadable two-minute uh, or 20-minute $2 tutorials that we call extra credit episodes over on another website. So on Scam School, I have to say, if you, you like that trick you saw me do, it's complicated. It takes a long time to learn it, but you can buy it for two bucks over at this other website. It would be great if instead you could have casual members learning all the easy tricks at Scam School and a more advanced stuff, you know, like Scam Academy, where it's something 2 to $4 a month to join in and you get uh, unprecedented access to uh, to hang out with the host and that kind of 
premium level, especially as YouTube continues to develop its personality, one of the things it's known for is the, the place where we go to learn how to do things. And maybe, you know, everything from uh, rebuilding an engine to uh, how to dance to how to these makeup tutorials. There are people who passionately follow these makeup tutorials and then somebody can show one of their premium things that takes longer to do that people are like, man, I really do want to be able to pull off that particular look. And I would pay $5 for, for a month for these premium level content. I think you're making a great point here because you're demonstrating very clearly what the value add would be for charging for the content. It's longer video. It has an instructional bent. Uh, it's not just sort of when I, I think when most people think of YouTube, they think of it in terms of kind of frivolous short-term entertainment. But what people like you are doing is training sort of niche audiences to think of it in, in a much more useful way. And as long as you play to that niche, if you can't crack this, I don't know who can because uh, it's not going to be just any old content that people are going to pay for. No, I think you're absolutely right. It all depends on what content is put behind the paywall. Uh, and, and I can imagine lots of ways that this could work. A video game high school or, or, or a drunk kitchen uh, or, or uh, you know, any of those big hits on YouTube – should not put their existing content behind this. They should Correct. do what Brian's describing and say, hey, super fans, do you want to get inside views or extra behind the scenes episodes or deleted scenes or, or whatever they could come up with that is valuable to that audience? $2 well, a month, a, you can get access to all that stuff. And it's a clear enough message. And apparently, uh, like Caffeine Free Dave in the chat room is saying, no, 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 Brian, nobody will ever pay for something that used to be free. Uh, this was exactly the problem we had when we announced these advanced tutorials. They're all like, what? Now Scam School wants you to pay? It's like, no, listen, the tricks you learn on Scam School, which have been and always will continue to be free, are nothing changes about them. But if you want premier, premium, uh, special stuff that would not exist unless there, I was charging for it, now that extra edition is available over here. Tom Terrific hey. asks if I have inside info about YouTube. My wife does work at YouTube, if you don't already know that, because I say it every show. I don't have any inside info about this. The, you got to stop even anything. responding at this, You're Tom. lying. <laughs> You're lying. Shake him down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Com just, just a real quick note here. Uh, Comcast did their earnings call. They added 500,000-plus subscribers. 433,000 were in high-speed internet, 211,000 were in phone. And if you're like, wait a minute, Tom, that's 600,000 subscribers or more. They lost 60,000 cable TV subscribers. So these television, cable television outlets, not losing huge amounts, but they're either very slightly up or very slightly down. And that's continued to happen. They blame it on the economy. We'll, we'll keep tabs on it for you. Well, you know, I, the way I see it is it's kind of much ado about nothing. I mean, it's almost a victory that they're losing that few. I mean, we could talk cord cutting all you want. At the end of the day, you know, this is a fully saturated marketplace. And if they're just losing 60,000 subs, the truth is they're probably making more money than ever from the existing sub base. There's just, you know, people love to call cord cutting alarms in this case. It's really not that big a deal. No, it's a really good point because they got $15.3 billion for Q1 and they attributed a lot of that to rate increases. So as they continue to, you know, make more money off the people they've got, a 60,000 subscriber loss is, is really not that devastating for them. Nope. Of course, the shareholders, they would like it to go up. Uh, let's move on to Tube Tops. Of course, Tube Top's all about the devices you use to watch the stuff that you want to watch. Uh, and real quickly, we don't have much, uh, as, as sometimes is the case in this category. But XBMC for, famine, man. XBMC for Android uh, is now in its uh, first official end-user-friendly release. Uh, back in January, they tried out what they called the end-user-friendly build. Uh, but now it's, it's solid. It's like now it's a stable release. Folks can go out. You have, you have to do a little side loading, so it's not entirely newbie friendly. Uh, but if you have an Android box uh, or a tablet that you want to run this on, you might want to go uh, look it up. Uh, yeah, you sounded a little bit uh, uh, Robo Tom there. So I guess, well, I don't know if you have to reboot something, but I'll say, let's move on to Film Found. Oh, oh I, I didn't know I had to go on and actually tell the story. <laughs> the first no, story know. here is, 
Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was wait. I was waiting to be disconnected and reconnected. Uh, New York Times, we mentioned previously, is getting into the video uh, game, uh, not video games, but doing video, and they took it away from their paywall. And it looks like one of the first things is out. They've partnered up with a nonprofit agency that does 15-minute documentaries called Retro Report. So these will be uh, showing up on the Boomer blog or Booming blog. It's anyway. It's for baby boomers. Uh, I watched the first one. What, they're called retro reports because they go into older stories and kind of say, oh, okay, what really happened? What do we know about it now that we have some time and distance between us? And this first one, I don't know if you guys remember this, I but do. The, the garbage this, barge. Yeah, the one that, that started the whole, uh, I mean, I guess, according now debunked idea that we were running out of place to put our garbage. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, it was it was essentially a guy who decided that it would be a good business to send the garbage down south. And then when it got down south, the people on the ports were like, we are not taking your garbage, New York. Uh, send it back. And then New York didn't want it. And it was a whole big thing. This is interesting. An inter- interesting play for the New York Times uh, to get into some documentaries. And these are high-quality documentaries. So it would be interesting to see what else comes out of this sort of push well, and it's the- interesting too that it's targeted at baby boomers because uh, you know this is the generation that you know when I was a kid we're listening to oldies radio stations and now we finally have oldies for the news we're like oh I remember that All it's right. just smart to utilize the archives in any respect I mean you think about companies like the New York Times or even me at Variety we were a, a hundred plus year old publication we sit on tons and tons of old content and I sometimes feel that if if publications like these spent more time just figuring out how to reactivate content that still has a lot of use in them, uh, it could be just as valuable as some of the new, fresh, original stuff that we're well, so and, focused on. And think about, like, we talked about the Yahoo Association with the Saturday Night Live clips. I don't know exactly what their agreement allows them to do, but I could totally see a curated tour experience where it's like you got somebody pulling out these these bizarre old clips that people ha- don't remember. I mean, yes, what will drive most of that traffic will people looking for particular things, but I'm sure there's some fascinating content that largely is overlooked, and if it was presented with the right story behind it, could be totally fresh and new. Yep. Kirsten Bell, we all know that she's involved in the Veronica Mars Project, uh, but she was also in an indie film called Some Girls, which was uh, debuted at South by Southwest. It's coming out June 28th in theaters, but also at Vimeo, on demand, uh, one, another one of these day and date releases. I don't know if this is news that they do this, especially indie films. They try this from time to time, I guess, because Kristen Bell's involved in it. It might get a little more attention. Well, and it's, it's, it's of- also good. Uh, you know, Vimeo's done a good job of being the YouTube of high quality, uh, you know, gorgeous content. And I, I guess really this is just the 21st century version of direct to DVD. Yeah, color me cynical, but uh, if it's going to Vimeo like this, my guess is this is not the project that's going to get Kristen Bell an Oscar. <laughs> that was exactly the tone of, of we used to say direct to, to videotape that you just said, if it's going to Vimeo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, Vimeo. Yeah, I know. I love Vimeo, but it, it does kind of have that, that tang to it. Uh Netflix, we were talking earlier about their original programming. We know Arrested Development coming up in a, a couple of weeks. Uh, Hemlock Grove just released. And they're going to miss June as far as I know. But in July, they'll be coming with Orange is the New Black. It's a comedy about a woman who gets sent to prison. Uh, not mistakenly exactly, but she, you know, she's not a hardened criminal. Uh, and it's from the uh, Genji the Kohan weeds. of Weeds. Yeah. So, I'm excited about this. I'm much, anyway. more, I'm much more excited about this than I was for Hemlock Grove and uh, not quite as excited as I am for Arrested Development. You know what? I'm actually more excited for this than Arrested Development. I'm going to out myself as one of the rare people who just didn't care that much for Arrested Development. I did like Weeds, though, so I'm looking forward to Orange is the New Black. Orange is the New Black coming July 11th. Now, Andy, I, I understand you've got to uh, take off. Do we need to let you go now? Uh, if you don't mind, I've had a great time. I hope we could do it again sometime. No, absolutely. absolutely Thank man. you for joining us. I'm sorry we're running a little late today. Uh, but, of course, folks can find your work at Variety.com. Uh, anything else uh, you're working on you want to tell them about? Some plugs, where to follow you on Twitter, anything like that? Yeah, just a Twitter, A. Wallenstein. Always happy to get into a good conversation or a fight or what have you. Just uh, follow me there. Excellent, man. Right Thank on, you so awesome. much for joining us. It was great having you on the show. Anytime. Take care. All right, take care.
Does that mean it's Let's, time, Tom? Does that mean it's time for what I've been waiting for? For the movie draft? Brian Brushwood, I you know I I saw that you you only got a uh, hundred million out of Iron Man three on uh, well, Friday. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Here's the weird thing. And first of all, I watched with great interest the early returns come in, and the the early most bullish uh, projections were as high as as you know two hundred million on the opening weekend. You know, people overseas outside of the United States, it was pulling in faster than more money and faster than the Avengers did. And for a brief moment, I was like, holy crap, this could be the whole game right here. Uh, here in the United States, it was just under 175 million, which is the second largest opening of any movie in the United States, full stop, uh, right behind the Avengers. Weirdly, though, not such a great number that I'm in the clear. Like, this undoes the damage uh, that I had with Oblivion. Uh, it'll be good if I'm lucky, and this is what it all boils down to, is how fast it drops off because we got, you know, of course, Star Trek coming out and, uh, and, and a bunch of other big titles. Um, if if it's able to get up to about $500 million, then I can kind of breathe easy. But other than that, with the rest of my slate, I'm not going to have the juice unless this continues to outperform expectations. Now, Oblivion is still the best buy now, there's only three movies that have come out, mind you. Uh, <laughs> yes. and, and Iron Man 3 has only had its opening weekend. Uh, but $5.4 million per dollar spent ain't bad. Well, Honestly. no. In, in general, you want to try to hit $10 million per per Brian Buck or whatever your unit is. Your, your, what, what's your top? Do you, do, you do you have merit marks? That's right. That's merit what you marks. call them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but uh, so I, I do feel like, They'll almost certainly get past uh, 460 million, or at least land around there. So all of Iron Man's going to be close to that 10 million per dollar mark. But uh, but I I needed to do even better than that to undo Oblivion. Well, uh, this weekend is the Great Gatsby. That'll be the first entry into the summer movie draft for Sarah Lane. She paid 17 Sarah shekels or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for, Lane for, Lira is what we called it. <laughs> Lane Lira. Okay, there we go. That's That was what I was looking for. Uh, and, of course, in two weeks, Scott Johnson is back in the race. He already had Pain and Gain. Uh, but Star Trek Into Darkness, that's his big movie uh, yeah, coming out. In two Pain weeks, and Gain so. didn't do nearly as well as I thought it was going to. It was, it's for it's the hype about as happened. well as I thought it was going to. That, <laughs> that's, a, that's about where I was with that. So uh, let's move on to what we're watching. <laughs> watching we are watching all kinds of you've got a ton of stuff in here do you want to start or end with yeah I'll, I'll go and jump well first of all let's just say we'll, we'll talk about iron man and we'll talk about uh, game of thrones in the spoiler zone right yes absolutely okay all right uh, spoiler alert i'm i liked both of those but we'll talk about why uh onion news empire i watched one of the pilots on Amazon, and I found it very pleasant viewing experience. The interface on the Amazon Instant was was super easy. Uh, the content, if it was anything other than The Onion, I'd be all like, wow, this is really daring and out there and a crazy idea, and I love it. If it was a small independent production uh, with a name that I hadn't heard of before, uh, I would have been, maybe not blown away, but super excited and hopeful about them doing more. With it being The Onion and The Onion having their reputation uh, of, of uncompromising excellence in comedy and their brutal video podcast that they've done before, it felt a little bit soft. And I would continue to watch it if it continued to come out, but wasn't like blown away like, ah, this is the greatest thing ever. So and, okay. uh, you don't have any well, comment. Uh, that's, that's it. it. <laughs> well, so, and then we're getting caught up on Veep which okay. just has me angrier than ever at the HBO Go desktop interface. It's like this thing is openly hostile to people trying to watch a series in order. When you get to the, first of all, to find anything, you can't just, it's, it's, it, and maybe we're trained by Netflix or even Amazon Instant. It's just, it's, you know what you want. You just type in the word Veep and it finds it and it lays it out on Netflix by season and you just click like, us, oh, start the first season. For this one, uh, you couldn't navigate. You would, they would say, hey, watch Veep. 
And you would click on it. You're like, oh, good. It's right there on the front page. And then you would navigate to it and it'd be like, well, watch this week's episode. I'm like, why would I want to watch this week's episode? And then, uh, and so he's like, I want to watch the first episode. So you click on seasons. It's like, watch the featurette behind the scenes on season two, episode one. It's like, no, I don't want that. I just want to watch them in order. And then, uh, and finally, when you navigate to it, you just have to do a hard search and then start it. And uh, unlike Netflix, which takes just a few seconds to pre-buffer and then starts instantly in high def, HBO Go on the desktop insists on ramping up its its feed. So it always starts at this horrible, like, 180p presentation. And after a few seconds, it upscales to 360 and then 720p. And you're, you're watching it in high def. But every time you pause it, it restarts and rebuffers. And the ironic thing is the every single bit of HBO programming starts with a that static image that starts, which of course is, no, 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 no. Well, well, that that plays fine, but the HBO originals where it goes, right? because that footage is inherently noisy and pixely, that means because it always starts off looking crappy, it it looks like bootleg pornography every time you start this thing up. And then the worst part is, the one that just made me mad was when you get to the end of an episode, there's a big arrow on the right that you click on. Now, what do you think when an episode ends and it's just sitting there with a black screen and there's an arrow to the left and an arrow to the right? What do you think happens when you click the arrow to the right? Well, obviously, it's going to take me to an entirely different selection of episodes for a <laughs> or different better show. Yet, it'll just automatically play the latest episode of Veep. And no. because you don't know what to expect... You just think this is the next episode, and what, now all of what sudden, device? Yeah, what device are you using to watch this? this? Is the desktop computer, right? Which would you? And this is what I have heard from from many people and have experienced myself oh. because it's the same interface on the Google TV. You're actually just looking at the desktop browser version of HBO Go. It sucks. <laughs> HBO is spending all of their time on the interface for iOS, for tablets, for 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 phones, for some reason, uh, which are gorgeous. They're beautiful. They're much easier to use, and they work. Whenever I use the desktop version of HBO Go, it is just awful. So I've taken to just airplaying. Anytime I need HBO Go, I airplay it from my tablet to my television. Uh, because yeah. e e e just using it on, on a on a desktop is is unusable. I to I totally agree with you. Well, and it would take so little for them to do those little touches. Just just steal what Netflix has done right. When an episode ends, auto play the next episode, or say next episode starts in five, four, three, two, one. Instead, it's just it makes me watch all the credits, and then it just stops and shows me a blank screen, as as if anybody is going to think that's a better experience. They're like, you know, I really like. That when the episode ends, it doesn't do anything. It just sits there like a useless piece of trash. I just anyway. don't think they're developing the desktop because they see that as too much of a competitor. So they're putting all of their resources on the tablets because they're like, well, that's not a competitor to our on-screen version. It's I'll just, bet you're right. It's just it's, ridiculous. It's, it is. It's pretty miserable. Uh, well, I've been watching, uh, obviously, Game of Thrones. We'll talk about Doctor Who. Uh, it sounds, sounds like you haven't bothered catching up. No, I haven't, and I feel bad, like morally bad about it. Should, should I be? Should I? Should I pick a few good ones, or can you just tell me which ones oh, I should what? watch? Be behind, just watch them. All right. Last week's okay. didn't make a lot of sense, but there were some fun moments. This week was a good episode. It was essentially vampires in Venice, except it was set uh, up in northern England, and it was Clara, not Amy Pond, uh, and it was uh, the lady Elena Tyrell is in it uh, as the bad. The evil person, um, Diana Rigg, played played the. Oh, uh, she was in it with her daughter, actually. This is just a good, solid episode. A couple nice little bits uh, alluding to the overall story arc, uh, and you get to see uh, Vash and Strax. Uh, you know th those guys from the Christmas special that they oh, had. Yeah. Left. So yeah, it's, it's a fun episode. And next week is Neil Gaiman's episode. You don't okay. want to miss that one. That's going to be. Well, then I'll, I'll definitely watch this week's, and I'll definitely get ready to watch next week's with, with Penny. Madman is uh, is moving closer and closer to the seventies all the time, style wise. And frankly, I watch that show to look at it. Uh, the the plot is just interesting enough to keep me going. It's not something I die to watch every week like I used to. Uh, Hemlock Grove, I continue to watch because I'm bored, and I'm like, I don't want to have to think about what I want to watch. And I know I'm in Hemlock Grove, so I watch it. Uh, but I'm not really all that interested in that either. The NHL playoffs. 
I, you know, remember we talking about being blacked out of watching my own local sports team? <laughs> yes. Because the fact that I don't pay an extra $10 a month for the platform and direct TV, I was able to uh, watch uh, the, the game. You, you seem a little squirrely. You seem a little sure. fishy. Is, there well, something I I should know? Is that illegal to use the VPN to watch? I'll tell you what. It certainly are, isn't unethical when we talk about our legal and unethical because I'm watching the local sports team. I guess it's unethical because I'm not paying for the tier. So it's probably illegal. No, it's know. okay. But, I am yeah. paying NHL.com for their package. Anyway. I, I do regardless. Look, VPN it up is what I say. Who cares? Let's go. Let's go to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Fame Radio. Yeah. We start with Phil from La Chute, Quebec. He knows about the NHL, I bet. Or maybe he hates it. I don't know. I uh, just want to say, <laughs> I, love the show. I always look forward to each new episode. I wanted to comment on what Brian said during the discussion of Game of Thrones. He said that at this point, he wishes he forget all that he knows from the books and just enjoy the show for what it is without pre-knowledge that the books give him. Being someone who's coming to the series late, that's exactly what I'm getting to do. I watched the first season and loved every minute of it. Then I got the first book on Audible and listened to that. I found myself enjoying it even more than I might have otherwise. The book was everything that made the show great, plus a little bit extra. I I could see where the two diverged or condensed particular aspects of the plot, and I was okay with it. In my head, I was able to separate the books and the show into two different works. Game of Thrones, the book, and Game of Thrones Season 1 told much the same story, but it told it in a medium-appropriate style. Whether you've read the books or not, the important thing that you and anyone who's watching a movie or TV show based on a novel needs to remember is this. You have to let yourself acknowledge that you're not watching the book as a TV show, but a TV show derived from the book. So here's the thing. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Tom, but uh, right now, and, and this relates, um, Night Attack 2, Enjoy the Garden, just it began its second week of uh, being the number one comedy album in the nation. And in Night Attack 1, like Justin and I had an argument about Jurassic Park, the book versus the movie, uh, and we figured out that the reason I didn't like the movie as much as he did was because I had read the book first. And everybody agrees that the books are better than the movies in general. So if you know that the book is likely to be better than the movie or television show. What is with this logic everyone has that they say, read the book first? Why? So you could be disappointed and like the TV show less? And I think it's I a matter of taste. Believe, I honestly I, don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. I think some people like cilantro and some people think cilantro tastes like soap. I think some people's brains prefer to have the entire world of the book created in their imagination first so they don't have their conceptions preset, then they can enjoy the movie. Whereas if they watch the movie first, then they feel like the the way the characters look and act is, is being forced upon them. While other people feel the way uh, Phil here, or feel, uh, here does, which is I want to be able to uh, just enjoy the more narrow aspect of television and then expand my knowledge and feel like I'm I'm not being spoiled, but I'm actually getting more by reading the book. And I think both perspectives are valid. Yeah, well, I think in general that when you watch the movie first, you are writing visual images on a blank palette, which means you will experience no disappointment. And if you like the story, then all that awaits you in the book is those same images that are consistent with what you're picturing, only expanded with all kinds of great content and ideas that didn't make it into the movie or book. When you do the reverse, you draw your own visual representations, and all that awaits you at the movie are disappointments on how it didn't match and or how you thought it better in your mind. That's, in general, universally, watch the movie first, then read the book. That's what I say. I, I don't think that's good advice for every person. And I'm one that's of those fine. people that when I watch the movie first... I don't enjoy the book as much usually because I feel like really? I'm being I'm being forced to imagine it the way I saw it in the movie. I'd much rather re read the book first and then be able to enjoy the presentation and the interpretation of the director who's doing the movie or TV version. It seems like a really good thing for people to write us at fr at twit.tv with their opinion. And as long as we're giving you advice, Tom, we got uh, from Patrick. He says, OMG, Tom, just saw that you gave up on Henlock Grove in the middle of episode six. Maybe you just needed some coffee. Skip over episodes six through 11. All you'll really miss is a couple of bloodbaths and I assume a plot point that I'm not going to read here. Uh, just watch episode 12 and episode 13. Episode 12 wraps up the season story arc about the, uh, the uh, plot item. And episode 13 opens up so many story arcs. I hope season two comes out 
by like next next September. But I didn't realize when I put this in the doc uh, that that you had continued to read how far or watch how far have you gotten? Uh, I think I got to episode seven. Well, according to this, one you just jump over I, mean, to- I didn't get gave up in the middle of the episode. I don't think. Maybe, maybe I had paused it in the middle. I don't remember. Uh, but I love the fact that he's like, "Dude, what's wrong with you? You just need to skip five episodes." <laughs> No, that's a that that is a bad thing. If, no, if you if, if you should know, like, oh, I, sh- I should probably just skip five episodes. Okay, and well, okay, but here's the thing. Let's say whatever awaits you in episodes twelve and thirteen is so good that uh, that that you would be doing yourself a disservice to miss out on that thing. Like, uh, kind of like people say, you know, like, oh, I don't know if I should play Bioshock Infinite. I never finished uh, Bioshock One. It's like if you started Bioshock One, you experienced enough of the backstory. That you should instantly jump to Bioshock Infinite if if that's what you're in the position to do. So it's like maybe that's what he's saying. He's like the experience at 12 and 13 is so good that if you're on the fence, just jump to 12 and 13 because that's all you're really going to get out of the whole series anyway. No, and I think that is what he's saying. It's just that he says, oh, my God, maybe you just needed some coffee. Like I should have known somehow. Okay, you can't, like, you, no, you, I appreciate. I appreciate that Patrick is giving me the heads up. Like, hey man, you can just skip right to eleven, or I, right. I guess to twelve, and and it's fine. I'm like, all right, that's all right, that's actually good advice. But I don't think the coffee would have helped me realize that. Oh, so you're, I, you're, saying, you're saying you're saying I don't like your attitude, Mister. That was unne- That was hurtful and unnecessary. Yeah, Patrick. Actually, yeah, a <laughs> coffee's always a good idea. So I I, I shouldn't even criticize that. I'll, I'll yeah, always. Yeah, you actually sounds like you need some coffee right now. Yeah, I do. (laughs) Let's go ahead and wrap things up and uh, head on over to the spoiler zone. That's it for this episode of Frame Rate. Unless you want to hear us talk about Game of Thrones and Iron Man 3, in which case stick around. Otherwise, you can always find us at twit.tv slash FR. You can email us frame rate at twit.tv or give us a call. Yeah, you can't give us a call. But oh, don't, don't forget about the YouTube channel. I, I've been checking the comments right. in those. I really enjoy people piping in on there because I don't think there's comments on the on the Twit page. No, and I always put the YouTube version up on Google Plus too. So YouTube.com slash frame rate. Is that right? Uh, I believe it's Twit frame rate. Twit frame rate. YouTube.com slash Twit frame rate. And of course, live.twit.tv on Mondays at 3.30 Pacific, 6.30 Eastern. Spoiler zone. Here we come. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a spoiler zone. This is an official spoiler zone. You are being alerted that starting first, we will be talking about Game of Thrones. If you do not want to be spoiled about Game of Thrones, stop listening. Reach for the stop button. Pull your car safely to the curb and (laughs) unplug the headphones from your mobile device because we are about to spoil Game of Thrones. I will hold up this mug again. When we get to Iron Man 3... I'll join. We'll, join viewers, we'll start mugging for you. That'll be your code. Audio viewers, you're on your own, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, all right, real quick. Spoiler alert. Uh, continue to love it. It's just the best show on television. Uh, this was a remarkable episode in that it held its own. It was fascinating. Uh, I, I was sucked into it, despite the fact that the show's most popular character didn't even make an appearance. And in fact, the, the character's... Uh, uh, I would say least bombastic personalities. You know, Jon Snow, we followed his story. He's acquired our character and I, I just loved all of it. I loved watching the progression with his relationship with Egret. That moment when when Egret was like, and I know your secret and she just calls him out on there, which uh, which I, if it matters, I don't believe that was ever in the book. Uh, I really dug- I don't remember. Uh, but, but well, what, it created a moment of, of um, conspiracy between them that I don't remember that flavor really ever happening in their relationship in the book. This whole, like, you know, well, I know and you know, and blah, 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 that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I don't remember that either. Uh, I, j- I just don't remember whether it was there. I know she had, she. he always felt like she was suspicious of him. I just can't remember if it was that overt. But it definitely right. captures their fun relationship, that bond that they start to have. Well, and we hadn't, until these last couple of episodes, seen Egret because in the books, you fall in love with her. And 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 that's what's starting to happen now. And in many ways, you know, we, it's, I I, I don't want to say, I don't want to misrepresent. Like, Jon Snow is, is like the best character in the books. Uh, and I feel like he's kind of quiet and boring-ish at this point in the TV show. Not that we don't like him a lot and respect him, uh, but he's one of the least colorful characters right now. But I think 
this episode went a long way to helping us in that because, again, most of the stuff he's done up until this point has been, you know, country bumpkin in the big city kind of amazed by, ah, oh, it's a giant. Oh, you mean I'm not very good with guile and you're all laughing at me? Fish out of water. Uh, and we're stuck. I think we're finally entering the phase where we're going to go back to seeing Jon Snow being more of a badass. It's country bumpkin in total different country bumpkin land, though. That's what's yes. so funny. You know, in, in I mean, like, it's not the sophistication of King's Landing. It's it's the wildlings. Uh, but it's exactly what you're talking about. It's exactly that flavor. I I did feel, you know, I, I, when you talk about Daenerys, I did I didn't realize we hadn't seen her until the previews. And I was like, oh my gosh, we went through the whole episode without her. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I can't wait. It looks like we're gonna get a lot of that storyline next week. I am starting to get and being super picky when I say this, starting to get a little bit antsy for stuff to happen, which is probably a good thing. You want to build that tension. Uh, but the, the end of this episode, I'm like, okay, I don't have a complaint about anything. I was never bored, but I kind of want the action to come back. Come on, let's let's get out there. Let's get I'm, on the road again. I'm I'm ready. To, I'm raring to go. Uh, enough enough with the good character building and the and the and the depth of feeling you've created about, around these characters for me. Okay, I care about them. Let's have them beat each other up now. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm torn because it's like I haven't minded it, and it's those slow moments. Okay, how many episodes in on this season are we? What This was what, episode six, right? I don't remember. Okay, let's say it's six. I think The chat room will tell us in like 30 seconds here. Yeah. Uh, which now has me playing the mental chess game of like, okay, there are so many big surprises that I know are on the table from the book, and I'm questioning which ones will happen when. Uh, with only four episodes left in this season and knowing that this season is comprised of half of the events from Storm of Swords, um, I think we're going to see uh, two very, very big ones. Very, very big celebration-related events. I think that... Um, and this is me playing the dance for people who haven't read the books. But, but do you know which ones I'm talking about? There's one associated with the color... And another associated with uh, a crime. How about that? I'm not even. I'm not even going to comment on these things anymore. Okay. All right. All right. Fine. Because uh, I, I, I actually have no internal sense of what sets people off for for okay. that kind of spoiler. We'll, 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 and I we'll got this raked over the coals for an offhand comment that I don't even think really ruins anything. Okay. Uh, fine. So I'm. I'm done. I'm not right. saying anything about the books anymore. Done, done. Then, then let's just say, uh, uh, I guess, I guess let's wrap up on it. Uh, but oh, yes, the the only other thing is I'm continuing to love watching the torture of Theon and the breaking down of him because it works so well. It's a very different way of telling it than the books did, but it works so well that it has me super stoked because, as you know, uh, Feast of Crows and Dance of Dragons are two simultaneous books that take place on different sides of the continent uh, or of, of of the of the globe. And what I'm excited about it is seeing that that it works to tell the story in a linear fashion with, um, uh, you know, with uh, uh, Theon tells me that we won't ever have to go through an entire book or an entire season, you know, without following, uh, you know, one particular character that we really like. You know, like it was really a bummer in Feast for Crows going the whole book, not seeing Tyrion's story, you know, because of the way it was broken down. And knowing that we won't have to do that, that we'll get to watch everything advance in lockstep with all of our favorite characters has me super excited. I did uh, I did get thrown a little bit when the red lady showed up with Beric Dondarrion. Yeah. Um, I liked it, though, because uh, even though I don't believe that happened in the book, it, it didn't. was a good establishing, a good way to establish that the Lord of Light is... A, a religion, not just a crackpot cult of a few people, but instead there are other practitioners of it. And I thought that was a good touching moment in general. Also, uh, Gendry's story has entirely changed now. We, uh, we, yeah. we don't know where he's going. Which, again, I trust them entirely. They're batting a thousand. There's not been yeah. one thing they've done that hasn't been great. Do uh, you think that they will actually take the story slowly in totally different directions to the point where it won't matter if George R. R. Martin has finished the next book or not? 
Ooh. Well, we already know that George R. R. Martin has sketched out how things should end, like as an insurance right. policy. He's told but a we few people. We also know that he is not going to allow them to show that stuff on TV first. Correct. Correct. And so, so what do you figure? He's got, we're looking at two seasons for Storm of Swords, two seasons for, uh, or I guess we'll say four seasons to cover uh, Dance of Dragons and uh, Feast for Crows to get caught up to where we are now. So we're looking at what seven, eight years for him to he could bust out two more books in eight years. That's oh, no, true, but he, that, he doesn't well, even they, have to do that because they might keep because splitting what seasons? But too. but but he doesn't even have to do that because he his next book just has to come out in the next six years or so, and then that adds two or three more seasons, so mm -hmm. that gives him more time for the last book. One would think. One would think. We'll see. <laughs> All right, shall we All go right, to Iron Man the three then? Yeah, let's hold up the mugs. Let's mug for the camera. Iron Man, Iron Man 3. 3. <laughs> All right. I loved it. Loved it. Had a great time. Uh, it, it did what is very hard, which is like after the Avengers and that orgy of violence and uh, after Iron Man 2 and it's just crazy suits everywhere you look and knowing the way they marketed it, where it's, it's traditionally been, you know, about the tech, they could have made this. The obvious next step is like, just make it even bigger, bro. Just, you know, crazy upgrades and, you know, Iron Man, you live for those moments where he is uh, overpowered. He's 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 way out armed his enemies uh, over his enemies. And it's very satisfying to watch him just come in and just, you know, lay waste. They did the impossible and they made a compelling story in which Tony Stark is is uh, physically at a disadvantage and emotionally crippled the entire time. And they did it in a believable way. Uh, and they hit all the notes that you would expect. But they did it in uh, this awesome twist that made me love it. Like that business with, uh, with you know, he meets a kid who's tech savvy and super smart in the middle of, of the, the woods in Tennessee. Like, yeah, okay, that's the kind of thing you do in these movies. But the twist they put is that Tony Stark is a dick to him the entire time, even at the end, where he's like, good for you, kid, and drives off. Uh, yeah. All of that was engaging. You, you hit those notes. But the biggest thing that I loved that the number one criticism people have given was the treatment for the Mandarin. Because, again, spoiler zone, if you've seen the movie, you know that essentially with the Mandarin, they pulled a nine-month con job. They started not lying to us, just letting us fill in our own blanks as to what the Mandarin was as a character and what it meant and what we were going to see from him. And to get to that point where instead he's a an actor, a figurehead, a, a nothing, a, a shell of a man who's a, a ridiculous pawn, it was awesome because it allowed them to play all that big buildup of, uh, of this, you know, who's this guy in a cave who's got high production value, slickly edited press release videos out there and the answer is uh it's not a guy it's an it's an organization who's selling a product and the product happens to be the mandarin now people are like yeah but in the comic books the mandarin was a badass it's like you know what no the mandarin was a thinly veiled offensive racist stereotype meant for you to hate asians i guess or whatever like like that clip we played at the beginning that's the mandarin with ridiculous magic rings that he's excited about and 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 a, and a racist attitude and to be honest i'm glad that they that they when i heard it was going to be the manner i was like how are you going to pull this off and not lose me and then you know they set it up with this whole osama bin laden thing but then they didn't even have to i, I don't want to say they didn't have to follow through with it but they uh, instead found a way to take us on that whole journey and manage to surprise and delight me with the way that turned out. I loved it. And, uh, of course, the one scene with Gwyneth Paltrow at the end was awesome. Even though you kind of knew something was going to happen, the way they executed it was an utter delight to me. I never did read the, uh, the Mandarin in the comic books. Uh, so is it is it as bad as that? comic there the cartoon uh, you that know what played. most of my reading of iron man uh from like eighth grade through graduating high school was uh was much more focused on tech side of things uh and the so so i only saw peripherally the mandarin once or twice i never saw major plot points with him but but i did watch all of those uh mandarin 1960s uh spy or uh, iron man cartoons and uh was never a fan. Like, you know, 
in a world, what makes Iron Man and Tony Stark great is that he's just a guy who's insanely driven and wicked smart, who believes that technology can make things better. And he does all that. And so to introduce a character with magic rings that do X, Y, and Z uh, is silly. Never really resonated with me. So again, I regarded the Mandarin as a villain as a potential pitfall. And instead, they navigated it beautifully. I thought this was the probably the, the least good of the three, but still entirely enjoyable. I thought the ending was environmentally unsound. I don't know why he had to explode all of the Iron Man suits. <laughs> and you talk about you want you for all the I people who were defend- sitting in the in the, the movie the whole time going, man, I wanted to see new features. I wanted to see new stuff. And here he is, just like with you know struggling to, with his PTSD. That was that was for them, right? Is they brought here you go. Here's all 42 of the suits that he has been working on, and you're going to see all kinds of crazy upgrades. You've been wanting upgrades. Here you go. Here's all the upgrades at once. Then why did he blow them up? <laughs> well, because and and I think they did a good job of of t- selling this part of the story because uh, part of what he was doing, the suit was always part of his his physical illness and then we saw an emotional illness over this movie and and by the end of it they they make they make him whole and theoretically this is the end of the iron man story but we all know avengers 2 is coming but in that it's moment at the very end did you stay to the end credits yeah yeah, yeah. Iron Man will return yes well that's that's fine fine whatever uh but but in this moment we all know there's going to be more iron man is my point but okay. in this moment we see uh, him become physically whole and emotionally whole. And in this moment, for him personally, Tony Stark doesn't need Iron Man. We've seen him uh, hide behind the armor the whole time in hilarious, you know, for, for very good reasons and, and with awesomeness as a result. But like in that moment that he feels like he doesn't need it, I thought it was, it was really delightful. I, I liked it. Iron Man 3, check it out. That's it for the Spoiler Zone. Thank you, everybody for joining us and we will see you next time.